सतो मदकमय तमसो मोतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मात गमय ओं शाति 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 ओम लीड अस फ्रॉम दि अनरियल टू द रियल लीड अस फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट लीड अस फ्रॉम डेथ to immortality om peace 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 good morning everyone nice to see all of you again after quite a few months i hope you all had a nice summer um today's title was a head scratcher for most of you probably and part of the fun is for you guys to guess what in the world i'm going to be talking about so let's start with the marshmallows some of you might be aware of the marshmallows actually once i tell you what what the marshmallows are about 1972 stanford psychologist walter michel ran an experiment involving a number of 4 year old children and marshmallows So there's a 4-year-old sitting at a desk and Walter says here's a marshmallow. He puts it on on his desk on a plate in front of him. And these kids, you have to assume these kids love marshmallows. And he says, you can have this one marshmallow now or you can wait 15 minutes. I'm going to leave the room with the one marshmallow there in front of you. and if you can just restrain yourself for 15 minutes i'll come back after 15 minutes and give you not one but two marshmallows what do you think about that and the kids are very excited cuz they already love marshmallows if you get two that's twice the fun all right so then the fun begins because then he leaves the room and it's really funny the way so these kids want two marshmallows not one So the kinds of things they do to kind of distract themselves, they shut their eyes so that they don't see the marshmallow in front of them, tempting them. These experiments were run later actually by people who reproduced um, the experiment. So one person who reproduced the experiment at Columbia University, his name is Joachim de Posada. And uh, he videotapes these children and one of these young girls to avoid temptation, but she, she can't help herself. So what she does is she she kind of takes the marshmallow and starts sniffing it <laughs> like this so she's not tasting it so she's kind of a technicality but then ultimately she succumbs at like minute i don't know what 7 or 8 or 14 before the 15 is up she ends up eating it but with after a lot of tor- self torment and so it's really funny to watch how these kids kind of try to exercise self restraint self control to prevent themselves from eating this very tempting marshmallow in that span of 15 minutes and then he comes back after 15 minutes experiments repeated on many different 4 year olds and his findings are as follows two out of the three kids succumbed within those within that 15 minute period they ate the marshmallow because they couldn't resist one third one out of three were able to restrain themselves not eat the marshmallow wait 15 minutes they're rewarded with two now it gets interesting because this was a longitudinal study which means that it's a long term study that tracks how these kids developed and fared many years later so he revisits these kids maybe 20 years later or something like that i don't know the exact time frame and sees their life outcomes in terms of physical health in terms of median income in terms of general well-being and happiness in terms of sat scores in high school and many other things educational achievement what does he find he finds that those kids at age 4 who were able to restrain themselves that minority group the one out of 3 had far better life outcomes than those who were not able to and this strikes me as highly significant what what the study shows and what many subsequent studies have shown is that self control self restraint delaying gratification are recipes for living a fulfilling life and a happy life
And that if you orient your life around instant gratification, instant pleasures, if those become your primary source of joy, you're going to end up miserable and less happy in the end. So that's what I want to talk about um, in more detail today and about how Vedanta can help us to live more fulfilling lives and happier lives. Now, you might say, well, this is a dated study. It's almost 50 years old, more than 50 years old. So what's its relevance now? It's more relevant than ever. Why? Because far more than in 1972, we now live in an age of instant gratification. This entire age, everything now, is oriented toward instant gratification. Let me try to make a case for that by uh, waxing autobiographical very briefly. I grew up in Boston in the 80s and early 90s, pre-internet. So it was a fascinating time to grow up as a kid. No internet until what, like early 90s, right? And so I remember, I, I listened to popular music and so how did I, I, I would, what I, I would, I and my friends would spend hours making mixtapes, right, with cassettes. Many of you younger kids might even know what cassette tapes are. But making, you know, finding, waiting for that one song to come on the radio or to find that tape that has my favorite song and then you make a list, you, you finally make a mixtape with like 15 or 20 songs on, the, on one side and the other side. Movies, you have to record them on videotapes. <laughs> TV shows, favorite TV shows. You have to wait once a week to watch them. But now what? We have streaming services, Spotify for your best music, as whatever you want, on tap. One, one of your favorite songs after another, anytime you want. Movies, you don't even have to go to movie theaters anymore because you have Netflix. And there's this phenomenon now called binge watching. If you love a show a lot, why wait a week? You don't need to. Watch 10 episodes in one day. Gorge yourself. Binge yourself. The language is telling. Binging. This is addictive language. It's a language of addiction. And this is the current age. This age of instant gratification. You don't have to go to movies. So, and, and for TV shows, you can binge watch your whatever. What about shopping? When I grew up, you'd have to go to brick and mortar stores. Half of them are now out of business. Bed Bath & Beyond and all these other stores. Kmart, I, think. I don't know if that still exists. Now there's Amazon. Whatever you want will be delivered to your doorstep within days without you having to lift more than a finger, just typing it on the computer. Everything is oriented toward instant gratification. What about finding a romantic partner? In the 80s, but before that 70s, you'd have to go somewhere to a singles night at a bar or this or that, actually meet other physical human beings. Now you have Tinder, you have dating sites. You could, and, and, you know, and there are different degrees of kind of how serious you want to get with the person. So Tinder's on one extreme where you just swipe left and swipe right. Dating sites are I want a more meaningful, but you don't even have to get out of your chair. Pornography, let's not even go there, but it's a huge problem now. Porn addiction is a massive problem because you can get as much pornography for free as you want and you just click, 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 click. Addiction. Social media. All of social media is oriented toward instant gratification, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. They give you what you want. How do they know what you want? They're extremely sophisticated algorithms masterminded by brilliant scientists and engineers to give you exactly what you want. The moment you click on a video, it figures out what your likes and dislikes are, gives you more of what you like, and avoids giving you things you don't like, and it becomes this echo chamber of instant gratification. I want more, I want more, I want more, until you become an addict, until you can't help but click on the next Instagram short or whatever it is, or go to the next tweet that, that kind of speaks along the lines of your already pre-established worldview and your likes and dislikes. So in this current age, we can get whatever we want, whenever we want, and in whatever quantity we want. If this isn't the age of instant gratification, I think it's historic. 
I think this is it. The internet has ushered in, and modern technologies have ushered in the age of instant gratification in a way that's historically unprecedented. And I think we're only beginning to understand the consequences, the repercussions, especially for youth who are, the, this is the first generation to be born into all these technologies. I wasn't, and so I, I know what the pre-internet age was, and I know what the post-internet age, internet age is. And so I can, there, there are ways in which I can appreciate the things of the past, the pre-internet age, and I can still, you know, I still read physical books, for instance, we might get to that later, but the virtues of reading actual books in your hand. Okay, so before I go forward, I want to mention another thing, though. So I, I, I hope I don't come off as an anti-technology Luddite, somebody who says, so therefore, you should run off to a forest and don't use the internet, don't use social media. No, the, the internet is incredible, it's an incredible tool, it's incredibly valuable in innumerable ways. I use it constantly partly because I'm an academic, and there are tremendous academic resources online that just didn't exist before. You'd have to go to physical libraries, and the problem is, especially for academics, it's very hard to get really, really world-class academic libraries. And now everything's at your fingertips. You have online subscriptions. Often academics will make their work available for free, as I do on, on, my, uh, on a website I use, academia.edu. Um, you meet other academics. So that's just, I'm just talking from the standpoint of my, you know, my uh, positioning as an academic. But think about uh, spiritual discourses. I'm giving a discourse now, but it's being recorded and it's going to be uploaded in a couple of days. And then people throughout the world can and do watch these videos, even during the pandemic. For people who are spiritual aspirants, being able to watch videos of other spiritual aspirants, people on the path, were a lifesaver because they couldn't go out. They couldn't do anything else. So it seems to me, I mean, the more kind of mature and balanced view about these modern technologies is that they're a double-edged sword and that everything depends on how you use them and how mindfully you use these technologies. Okay, so that's part of one of the themes that's going to come up again. Now, coming back to this major issue, which is that we now live in an age of instant gratification. And you might think, logically speaking, isn't that a good thing? Isn't it good that we're getting more of what we want? Surely that's good. You might think so, but every study points in the opposite direction. What they're finding is <clears throat> people who are, people whose lives are most oriented around instant gratification are the most miserable, the most depressed, the most anxious, the most, uh, Unhappy. There's a study um, just published this year, a Mental Health America study called The State of Mental Health in America. What were some of the key findings? More than one-fifth of Americans now suffer some form of mental illness. Millions of Americans have suicidal ideations. Over one in 10 youth in the US are experiencing depression, which is a far higher percentage than it was in the past when I was growing up, for instance. And this, is tr this was true before the pandemic, and it's just everything has gotten worse post-pandemic. Because what? Well, because you're sitting at home, and then what are your options? You, you sit at your computer and get even more kind of drawn into this whirlpool of instant gratification, the different social media and other things that, that you find on the internet. So this is what I would call the paradox of instant gratification. You would think that the, the, the more instant gratification you get in greater quantities, the happier you'll be, but in fact, you become more miserable and depressed as a result. And the big question is why? And many scientists now, neuroscientists, psychologists, are exploring this question, and they're trying to answer this question. So I want to begin by uh, talking about one of these very contemporary scientific answers to this serious question. How do we explain this paradox of instant gratification? How do we explain the fact that we're getting far more of what we want than any time in human history, and yet we're unhappier than ever? Anna Lemke is a psychotherapist at Stanford. This is the second Stanford uh, professor I'm referring to. She wrote a book just two years ago, um, called Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. 
dopamine nation, and it's really dopamine world in a way because of the globalization of internet and smartphones. It's available everywhere. You find it in Indian villages now. You find smartphones. You find there's this service called Geo, and it's very cheap to get internet all day on your smartphones, even in India. <coughs> so what's dopamine? Dopamine is, it's complicated and, and the scientific research on this is developing day by day, but, and I'm not a scientist, I'm just an amateur about this, but I'm going to explain uh, as far as I understand it. Dopamine is considered to be the craving or feel-good chemical. It's a neurotransmitter that's responsible for allowing you to feel pleasure, for allowing you to feel satisfaction and motivation in the things that you do. Whenever you feel good about having achieved something, it could be something very simple like eating a meal, it could be running a marathon, it could be completing a doctoral dissertation, or successfully completing a scientific experiment. What happens? You get a kind of surge of dopamine in the brain. That makes you feel the desire to repeat that kind of achievement again. Um, this is how Lemke puts it. She says, scientists rely on dopamine as a kind of universal currency for measuring the addictive potential of any experience. The more dopamine in the brain's reward pathway, the more addictive the experience. So there's a direct connection between dopamine and addictive tendencies. What's the logic? The logic is any form of instant gratification will lead to a, a sudden spike in dopamine levels. What happens then? We desperately want to repeat that experience and get that spike again. And so what do we do? We repeat the experience. The more we repeat the experience, what happens is our tolerance, this is a technical term used in science, but our tolerance for that substance or behavior increases. It goes up. Which means what? Ultimately, the more we indulge, the lower our dopamine levels become and the fewer dopamine receptors we have in the brain, which makes us less and less happy and we're craving, we have to take more of that substance or engage more in that behavior to get that same level of dopamine. And it's a never-ending cycle. It's a vicious cycle. And that's what's resulting in depression at the physiological level, we can say, at the level of neurochemistry. So a lot of work has been done on substance addictions, like addictions to drugs, like cocaine and heroin, alcohol, cigarettes. And they've, they've run experiments on this, seen how dopamine plays such an important role in perpetuating these kinds of addictions. But now, in this, as I'm saying, this age of instant gratification, there's a new kind of addiction which has become a pandemic in its own right. It's, what's, it's what scientists call behavioral addictions as opposed to substance addictions. We're addicted to certain kinds of behavior. We're addicted to things like social media, our smartphones, having to check constantly. Every time you hear a ping, you can't help but look at what is that because you get that little, little dopamine burst every time you get a notification, every time you check your email, every time you get a retweet of one of your posts, every time you look at another Instagram short, and so on and so forth. So Lemke goes so far as to say, and I, I don't think she's wrong in saying this, I don't think she's exaggerating, she says, the smartphone is the modern day hypodermic needle, delivering digital dopamine 24 seven for a wired generation. It's like having a crack, crack pipe with you at all times. It's there with us at all times. It's me with me right now. You see, this is unprecedented. She says, the pull of dopamine is so strong that studies have shown tweeting is harder for people to resist than cigarettes and alcohol. And smartphones, as I said, have just exacerbated the problem. It's one thing to be using social media on a laptop like this or tablet. It's another thing to have it, the thing, the device, in your pocket at all times right next to you at the bedside. And so another problem that's happening is people can't, they try to sleep, but then they're always, and they have their phone on silent, but then they're wondering after 15 minutes, well, maybe I got, let me just check once more. And then they check again. And they look at these bright screens. It affects their sleep. It affects their, I mean, thinking about kids, it affects their studies. It affects their well-being. There's an actual term for this coined by scientists. It's called nomophobia, N-O-M-O -O phobia. No mo, no mobile phobia. It's a fear of not having your mobile phone even for short periods of time. This is a thing now. It's become a disease. People freak out. If, 
parents among you, uh, in this audience will understand this. If you take your, smart, your kid's smartphone away for, what, for two hours, they freak out. Often, not always, but they often do. Another statement she makes, Lemke, from this Dopamine Nation book. Studies have shown that the constant stream of retweets, likes, and shares from these sites, these social media sites, causes the brain's reward area to trigger the same kind of chemical reaction seen with drugs like cocaine. In fact, neuroscientists have compared social media interaction to a syringe of dopamine being injected straight into the system. And these algorithms are a huge part of the problem, as I've said already, is that all of these social media sites are built on these algorithms which constantly reward us with exactly what we want, again and again in as, as great a quantity as we want. So what's happening? All of these modern technologies are turning us into dopamine addicts. This was, it used to be the purview of people, un those unfortunate few who are addicted to certain substances like cocaine or alcohol or cigarettes or whatever. Now it's become ubiquitous. Behavioral addictions have become ubiquitous because of modern technologies like the internet and social media. And this brings me to the first part of my title. So now you, you understand the marshmallows part of, of, of mice and marshmallows. And of course you caught any of the Americans among you who know American literature, the classic John Steinbeck novel of mice and men. But what about the mice? So now I get to the mice. Mice and rats. I lose the pun on Steinbeck if I add rats, and so I went with mice, of mice and marshmallows. So let's start with an experiment with mice. There's uh, a Swiss scientist named Christian Lucia. He's run a lot of experiments on mice. One of them, having to do with dopamine, is very interesting. He created a, mi a cage for mice in which there's a lever. If the, mice pus if the mouse pushes that lever, it uh, activates the brain's, the, the, the mouse's neurons in such a way that the dopamine receptors are fired and, and it, gets, it gets this kick of dopamine, a surge of dopamine, every time the mouse hits the lever. So what happens? You can probably guess. The mouse, with unlimited access to that lever, what will it do? It doesn't stop. And then the scientist says, and this is a direct quote, he says, if after two hours we didn't take them out of the cage, they wouldn't eat, they wouldn't drink, then they'd probably die quickly, but very happily. <laughs> this is it. This is how addictive dopamine is. There are other studies done, kind of follow-up studies, also very fascinating. Same mouse. Same, same lever on the other side of the cage, but now the scientists have added an electrically charged grid separating the mouse from the lever so that it's very painful to get to the lever. Okay, what happens? No matter how painful it is, the mice still suffer through and walk over that grid with great difficulty to be able to press that lever, ah, oh, and then it hits the lever. And every time it hits the lever, it's still on the grid. It's not that it's free from the grid. And every time it hits the lever, it's getting electrocuted, and still it does it. This is, this, is, this is our predicament, says Vedanta. This is the tragedy of human existence. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, it's like, it's like camels who love to chomp on cacti to get that little bit of juice in the cactus. But in order to get that little juice, you have to get cut. It's going to have bleeding gums, bleeding mouth, as it chomps, to get that tiny bit of juice. He says, worldly people are like that. To get that tiny bit of that little burst of dopamine, that little bit of instant gratification. We undergo no end of sacrifice, humiliation, self-degradation, like these mice. Even more interestingly, same situation, there's a mouse on one side of the electrically charged grid, but instead of a lever with dopamine, they place food. A necessity for all of us to live. Do the mice make the effort to cross the grid? No. They'd rather die than to get to that food. That means this is really painful, this grid. <laughs> but the moment you place a dopamine lever, it's going <laughs> to... It's going to cross that grid just to get that, those, those bursts of dopamine. And it'll die happily. 
Happily means what? <laughs> what kind of happiness is that, right? So you might be thinking, poor rats, poor mice, and it's true. That's a kind of separate ethical issue, whether we should be even doing these kinds of experiments on rice and mats, uh, uh, rice and uh, rice, rice and mats, rats and mice. Poor rats, poor mice, poor us, because we're the mice, we're the rats. What's the lever for us? That lever takes many different forms, any form of instant gratification now. That lever is social media. That lever, lever is the internet. That lever is dating websites. The lever is Tinder. The le pornography. These are all levers. Drugs, any kind of drug that you can also, actually the internet has also facilitated getting the drugs that you want, the substances that you need. You can order them online. They'll be sent to you within a day. All of these are levers and where are the mice? Where are the rats? And we can't help but push the lever again and again and again and again. We're all dopamine addicts. So now, this has all been, I've been painting a kind of bleak picture. But now we get to the question of solutions. How does Vedanta, first of all, how does it help us to get to the root of the issue? Because the dopamine versus, I don't think that's deep enough. We can go deeper. And I think Vedanta helps us to go deeper. And even more importantly, how does Vedanta help us to solve these problems? And to cope and to navigate through this unprecedented age of instant gratification so that we can live happy and fulfilling lives and spiritually rewarding lives. Let's start with the Bhagavad Gita, one of the greatest scriptures of Hinduism and Vedanta. In chapter 18, Krishna distinguishes different kinds of happiness. Sukham is a Sanskrit term. And he classifies these three kinds of happiness, Sukham, in terms of the three gunas. So we need to know something about the gunas here. What are the gunas? I like to translate gunas as energies. Even though it's usually translated as qualities, I like energies better. The three energies, what are these energies? The energy of tamas, which literally means darkness. It, makes a, it manifests in us. If we have a lot of tamas in us, what happens? We feel sleepy. We feel like when, if we have a looming deadline, we'll tend to procrastinate. We'll put things off until the last minute. We may have to ask for an extension. We're late, we tend to be lazy. We don't really have, feel that motivation to do things. We're always kind of criticizing other people, judging others, but thinking ourselves great, sleep a lot, so on and so forth. And, and we're full of kind of brain fog and confusion. That's also a sign of tamas. Rajas, the second guna, the second energy. That makes us active, up and doing, wanting to do things, being full of ambitions, desires, motivation. I want to do this so that I can get this. But it can also make us hyperactive if we have an excess of rajas and full of too many desires and ambitions. And sattva, the most spiritual of the three qualities, it makes us calm. It makes us more indrawn. It makes us humble. Oh, another feature of rajas is ego. Arrogance, ego, boastfulness. You can, you, every one of you knows that person or multiple people. Anytime you talk to them, they're always bragging about themselves and their accomplishments. That's because they have an excess of rajas. They're very rajasic. Sattvic people, you'll find, people with a lot of sattva, they don't brag about their, they might have accomplished a great deal, but they don't trumpet their accomplishments to the world. They're calm, they're quiet, they're humble, self-effacing. They're eager to help other people. They're less self-centered than rajasic people and tamasic people. So, with that in the background, this, this doctrine of the three gunas in the background. Now we can understand the Gita's views on different kinds of happiness. And I want to focus on two. The Rajasika form of happiness, and later we'll get to the Sattvika form of happiness. Tamasika is not quite as relevant here, but you can ask about it later if you want. So what's Rajasika happiness? This is chapter 18, verse 38. The Sanskrit is, Vishayendriya sanyogat yattadagri mritopamam Pariname vishamivat tatsukam radhasam smritam Translation, rajasika happiness is happiness that derives from the contact of the senses with sense objects. In the beginning, says Krishna, sense pleasure is like nectar, amrita, but eventually it becomes like poison, visham, becomes like poison. So over a millennium ago, the Gita has diagnosed the problem that we're currently facing. This is, the, this is the paradox of instant gratification. Any form of instant gratification falls under this rajasika happiness. 
Because in the beginning, you get that little burst of dopamine. You get that little moment of joy, followed by what? Misery and unhappiness. The more you do it, the more unhappy you become. It becomes like poison in the end. So what the Gita has established about Radhisika happiness has been corroborated by no end of contemporary scientific and psychological studies, as I've already talked about, involving mice and marshmallows. Sri Aurobindo, a great uh, sage and scholar, Vedantic sage, he said the following in his commentary on this verse from the Gita. He says, he's explaining why. In wh why are all forms of instant gratification poison in the end? He says, Rajasika joy, Rajasika happiness is nectar to the lips at the first touch because of that dopamine burst. But there is a secret poison in the bottom of the cup. And after that joy, the bitterness of disappointment, satiety, fatigue, revolt, disgust, sin, suffering, loss, transience. And because it's impermanent, that's what he means by transience. It doesn't last. No form of instant gratification can gratify you continuously. That's the problem. And Vedanta goes even further. Why exactly are all forms of instant gratification poison in the end? I have to tell you a story now to answer this question. This goes back to another one of our great Vedantic scriptures, the Bhagavata Purana, chapter 9. Some of you might be familiar with the story. It involves a great king named Yayati. He's a wonderful king, but he had a weakness for instant gratification, as many of us do. So what happens? He has a few sons, and this is, this is not realistic, but you have to just think about the lesson behind the spiritual lesson behind it. So he, he asks his sons to come forward, and he says, which one of you will exchange bodies with me, physical bodies with me, because they're young, so that I can enjoy sense pleasures and different forms of instant gratification for many more years than I can in this body because I'm now decrepit, I'm old, but I still have that insatiable craving for sense desires. The youngest son agreed, very obedient son. He said, okay, I'll take my body, oh father. They exchanged bodies. He goes on enjoying with that body and the time frames obviously are massively unrealistic. It's like I think thousands of years and he's really going headlong into sense enjoyments, all forms of instant gratification, many, many women and this and that. After all that, he returns, he, they exchange bodies again. He gives his son's body back to the son and he takes his old body and he comes to this insight. He becomes a sage after all this. He realizes, I'll say the Sanskrit first, this is his great insight. Na jatu kamaha kamanam Translation, desires are never satisfied through enjoyment, through gratification. Rather, and it gives a beautiful analogy, just as a fire gets even bigger, it flames up even higher when one throws oil into it. Just so, desires become even stronger, intensified, the more one indulges in forms of instant gratification. In this one verse, Vedanta explains why desires are at the root of all of our suffering. The logic is simple. Why do we have a desire? Because we don't feel complete. We feel some kind of emptiness within us. And we think in our heart of hearts, that if I only get that thing that I desire, that X, that Y, that Z, if I only get that X, then that void will be filled, and then I'll be happy. And it's never true. It's never been true in the history of humanity. And yet we still persist like those mice in, in pressing that lever. We can't get out of that cycle. Why? Think about money, for instance. Think about somebody who, has, who makes $50,000. What's that person's desire, let's say? They want $100,000. That person's convinced, if I get $100,000, then I'll be able to raise my kids well, I won't have to worry about money gets the $100,000, what happens? Starts hanging out with a different friend group who make $250,000 a year. Uh-oh, now $100,000 is not enough. And now I wanna hang with these guys and I don't wanna look bad in front of them. And is there any end to that? You wanna be a millionaire and then, and then the millionaire wants to be a billionaire. 
My friend has two yachts, and so I need to get two yachts. I only have one. Desires are never satisfied through enjoyment. They only get stronger. So we get caught in this vicious cycle where we think that by fulfilling the desire, we'll be happy, but instead, the desire just gets stronger and stronger. And we, and we become, we, that void grows bigger and bigger in our hearts. The great German philosopher Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer, he was not coincidentally influenced by Vedanta. He said that the Upanishads, he read the Upanishads at bedtime, and he said, they, are, they have been the solace of my life, and they will be the solace of my death. He says the following, Every satisfied desire gives birth to a new one, a new desire. No possible satisfaction in the world could suffice to still our craving, set a final goal to our demands, and fill the bottomless pit of our hearts. So now again, I'm becoming bleak again. So what's the solution? What does Vedanta say? What's the way out of this vicious cycle of dopamine addiction, of this addiction to instant gratification? Vedanta says, what you're going to find through your own experiences in the course of not just one life, but many lifetimes, that true happiness comes from reducing your desires rather than fulfilling them and increasing them. That's it, in one sentence. That's why the wife of Sri Ramakrishna, the spiritual consort of Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother Sharada Devi, she was often asked, well, you tell us to pray, but what should we pray for to God? She said, pray for desirelessness, nirbhashana. Pray for desirelessness. This is very interesting. Because she knows that if you're desireless, you have everything. You have illumination. It's desire that's holding us back from, from happiness, from fulfillment, from, from the spiritual goal of life, from enlightenment itself. It's that one thing. That's why the Buddha deemed it to be the first noble truth and the second noble truth. The first noble truth, all life is suffering. Second noble truth. The cause of all suffering is tanha in Pali. Trishna is the original Sanskrit. Craving, desire. That's it. He pinpointed the problem. And Vedanta did that as well, before him actually, in the Upanishads. Another wonderful verse from one of our great Vedantic scriptures. This comes from a text called 100 Verses on Dispassion. Uh, or Detachment. It might be a better translation of Vairagya. Vairagya Shatakam. It's a beautiful poetic uh, treaties. So, this verse goes as follows in Sanskrit. Satu bhavati daridro yasya trishna vishala manasi chak paritushte kortavan ko daridraha That person is poor whose desires are great. When the mind is contented, who is rich and who is poor? I love this verse. What's the idea? The idea is, this verse is defining very succinctly what is true poverty and what is true wealth. True poverty is being filled with desires that are insatiable and that can never be fulfilled. And true wealth is being content with what you have. That's it. If I have a hundred dollars and I'm content with that, there are some places in India where a hundred dollars, if you convert it, it's ample to live on. That person, that, that, that poor, we think poor Indian villager is much wealthier from a spiritual standpoint, from an even the standpoint of psychological well-being than those billionaires out there who are tormented by the fact that they only have five yachts and not ten. <laughs> Just think about that. Reflect on that. Meditate on that. We should try to learn from that. So the secret of happiness, says Vedanta, is to be content with what you have. Another very practical piece of advice which the Bhagavad Gita gives us, which is very concrete and something that we can all learn from and apply in our day-to-day -day life. And this is where I get to the other form of happiness. So far, I've explained the Rajasika form of happiness, which is any form of instant gratification, which is what? It's like nectar in the beginning, but poison in the end, remember. But Krishna defines then, by contrast, sattvika happiness as follows. Sattvika forms of happiness, of joy. Yattad agre vishameva padiname mritopamam tatsukham sattvikam proktam atma buddhi prasadajam. It's a wonderful verse. Translation, sattvika joy is joy that is born of the satisfaction of the higher mind and soul. 
the Atman. Sattvika happiness, sattvika joy, it's like poison in the beginning, but like nectar in the end. So see how these rajasika happiness and sattvika happiness are diametrically opposed. Rajasika happiness is like nectar in the beginning, poison in the end. Sattvika forms of happiness are like poison in the beginning. When you first start engaging in something sattvic, most people don't like it. That's, in that sense, it's like poison. It's like pulling teeth. Eventually, as you persist, and if you're sincere, that very activity will become a source of great joy. It becomes like nectar. And there's another very uh, evocative phrase used in this verse, the last word. Atma buddhi prasadajam in Sanskrit. Sattvika forms of happiness are qualitatively different from Rajasika forms of happiness, from forms of instant gratification. Why? Because sattvika forms of joy are all based on delayed gratification. Because you have to exercise self-restraint, self-control, self-discipline to arrive at that nectar in the end. Okay? And the even deeper metaphysical reason why instant gratification is qualitatively different from sattvika forms of joy is that they gratify different parts, different, uh, different parts of the human personality. Let me put it that way. Rajasika forms of instant gratification gratify the ego, gratify the body-mind complex, pl complex. Either gratifies the body or it gratifies the mind or some combination of the two. Sattvika forms of joy gratify the deeper soul within us. That eternal Atman within us, which is ever pure, ever free, ever divine, that's what's gratified. That's what's joyous when you experience sattvika forms of happiness. That's what makes it qualitatively different. And that's why, this is the practical tip, says the Gita. The more you're able to replace rajasika forms of happiness with sattvika forms of happiness, the more fulfilled you'll be, the happier you'll be, and the more spiritual progress you'll make. And the closer you'll come to the goal of spiritual fulfillment. Now you might be asking, well, it's clear what rajasika forms of joy are, any form of instant gratification, sense pleasures of all kinds. Give me examples of sattvika forms of joy. So let me give you a few, but once you, you'll get the hang of it as soon as I start giving, giving you some examples. First, the joy of spiritual practice. Any kind of spiritual practice, any kind. It's not, usually it's not that fun in the beginning. You don't get that dopamine burst in the beginning from doing what? What do I mean by different forms of spiritual practice? Vedanta says there are four main yogas. Karma yoga, the yoga of selfless action. Do your daily duties, but do them as worship of God if you believe in God. Try not to get attached to the fruits of your actions. Try not to get elated when, when you succeed. Try not to get dejected when you fail. Is that easy? No, it's incredibly difficult. It's like poison in the beginning. But the more you cultivate that attitude, that attitude of a karma yogi, the happier you'll become and the better you'll be able to accomplish those duties, those tasks actually. That's the other interesting thing. It's not that you'll lose interest or motivation in doing those things. You'll become happier and even better at doing that work if you're less attached to the work and to the fruits of the work. That's one example. But there are three other yogas. Bhakti yoga, the yoga of devotion toward the personal God for people who have an innate faith in God. Prayer, worship, singing devotional songs. Arati, which we have in our centers, for instance. All of these are forms of devotional spiritual practice. In many, in many cases, in the beginning, it's, it's kind of mechanical. It doesn't come from within that you really enjoy it in the way that you, you almost always prefer to watch Top Gun Maverick than to, or what's the latest, Barbie or whatever, than, than to go to a temple and attend an arati or singing devotional songs together. Mantra Japa is another example, of a, of, especially if many of you might be initiated in our tradition. The guru gives you a mantra and asks you to mentally repeat that mantra. That's a spiritual practice. In the beginning, it really, it's like the, the mind kind of, you don't want to sit, you don't want to repeat the mantra, it feels like you're pulling teeth. Eventually that becomes like nectar, if you're sincere about it. And it becomes a source of joy. And then you wake up in the morning and the first thing you want to do is sit in the shrine and do your mantra japa. So that's one example, any kind of spiritual practice. But, there are many other things. See, one mistake that spiritual aspirants often make is, they bifurcate their lives. How? 
They say, I do spiritual practice in the morning and in the evening when I sit in, in the meditation chamber. And I do what my guru tells me or, you know, I meditate or I do mindfulness, whatever it is. The moment I get out of the room, then life begins. And I have to raise my kids. I, I have to sometimes argue with my husband or my wife. I have to listen to my boss and sometimes get into arguments with him and my coworkers, and then the drama begins. And that somehow is not spiritual practice. I do spiritual practice for 15 or 20 minutes a day in the meditation room, and then the other 24, for the rest of the time, 23 hours and 30 minutes, it's just my ordinary life. That's a huge mistake. What we need to try to do is to spiritualize every moment of our life. To spiritualize everything we do in the course of our day from waking up to going to bed at night. And so let me give you some examples. Many of you have to commute to work. You drive. Or even if you commute you know, by metro or whatever, by subway, you, you can listen on ear, earbuds. You listen to music. Many people listen to music. What kind of music do you listen to? Do you listen mostly to popular music? Most popular music is popular because it's rajasic, because it gives you those dopamine bursts at regular intervals. Highly repetitive, very strong bass lines. Bass, bass is something very interesting because it, it like taps into our baser instincts. That's why if you go to a nightclub, what kind of music do they play? Music with incredibly strong bass lines and where you like feel your whole body convulsing with the bass, you know, because it makes you want to dance and get up. Radhasika music, popular music. And think about music with lyrics. Most popular music has lyrics. What kind of lyrics? Oh, why'd you break up with me? Or good riddance to you, good thing I broke up with you. I love you, why don't you love me? Isn't this the content of 98% of popular music? Yes. I'm thinking of Olivia Rodrigo, oh, she has a song, what is it, Driver's License? This is like that, right? All right. Now, by contrast, what about sattvika music? Music, you can imagine. See, sattvic happiness is not that instant kind of gratification, so the ma majority of people are not going to take to it. So you can guess. In the West, classical, a lot of classical music falls under sattvic joy, sattvic music. Not all. In fact, if you're a real connoisseur of classical music, you can probably divide different forms of classical music into tamasic classical music, radhasika classical music, and sattvic. But there is a lot of sattvic classical music. What are some examples? There's an incredibly rich tradition of what's called sacred classical music because many of the greatest composers were also believers. They, they were spiritual aspirants and they were Christians mostly. Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Haydn, Handel, and so on and so forth. And so many of them put Catholic and Protestant masses to music. Johannes Brahms, the great German composer, he did this incredible Protestant mass called Ein Deutsches Requiem, or, or Requiem actually, a German Requiem. Uh, Bach, Bach's Mass in B minor, Mozart's Mass in C minor, Beethoven's Missa Solemnis, Haydn's Nelson Mass, and many others. Bach was very pious. He wrote 200 church cantatas. For every week, it turned out a new cantata. Beaut and he would put these biblical themes directly taken from the Bible to beautiful music. And some of my favorite classical pieces are psalms put to music. Because if you go to the, the, um, the Psalms, the book of Psalms, in the Hebrew Bible, what you'll find is these are extraordinary poems of ecstatic longing for God. That's what they're about. And by listening to that, by listening to that song with concentration, it elevates the mind. Remember, this gratifies the soul rather than the body-mind. It, it makes you come, somehow feel, it makes the problems, the petty drama of the ego feel somehow small and irrelevant when you're in that moment. So music is an extremely potent form of spiritual practice, depending on what you listen to. And again, I'm not saying, it you know, you have to take yourself where you are. If you listen to popular music all day, try to add like one nice sattvika piece of classical music, maybe at, right before you go to bed. I do that often. It's a wonderful way to end the night. Listen to a two to or five minute piece of sacred classical music. Or if you like Indian devotional music, bhajans, or Indian classical music, Bandit Jasraj and Bhimshan Joshi and others, listen to that. Any of these forms of music will elevate the mind and make it more spiritual. That's why in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, on almost every page, somebody sings a song, Sri Ramakrishna hears a song and goes into samadhi. That's how potent a form of spiritual practice music can be. Ask yourself what kind of movies you, you watch. What do you watch? Do you watch? 
the, the big Hollywood blockbusters, or do you watch the more challenging, demanding films that are s slow, boring? These are terms used by Rajasika people to criticize <laughs> sattvika forms of film. What are some examples? I'm a lover of art film, and some, so some examples would be Ingmar Bergman's, this is a great Swedish filmmaker, his films, many of his. The Seventh Seal, Wild Strawberries, Winter Light. Andrei Tarkovsky, the great Russian filmmaker. I recommend a, a film called The Sacrifice. And it's a double whammy because it opens. That film, The Sacrifice, Tarkovsky's The Sacrifice, opens with my favorite Bach aria, Ebama Dich, which means, oh, oh Lord, have mercy on me for the sake of my tears. Listen to those lyrics. Bach put that to music in the St. Matthew Passion. And it's the beginning of Tarkovsky's The Sacrifice. So that's, an, again, an example. And the thing is, I'm not, again, I'm not saying go cold, 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 cold turkey on you know, Hollywood films. No. But uh, watch your Hollywood films if you want. And then once in a while, sit down and watch something more sattvic. Another one, and it's an acquired taste, I have to say, but uh, I love this film. A German filmmaker goes to France and goes to a famously austere Christian monastery. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's a monastery of Carthusian Christian monks. After great difficulty, he gets permission to film there. And he films an almost three-hour documentary, almost no words. It's a silent film, practically, of just the daily life of the monks there. And it's incredibly moving. And watching that, but again, don't blame me if you fall asleep. Because I, gave, I mentioned this yesterday in San Diego, and, and the Swami got up at the end and he said, you know, I, I went with another Swami when that movie came out and we both fell asleep. <laughs> so, so even Swamis, they don't always take to sattvika forms of film. So anyway, don't blame me, but if you acquire it, wonderful, because it means that you're progressing and you're moving away from rajas to sattva. Um, another example. And this might be more surprising to you, but I strongly believe it. Physical exercise. You might think this is a paradigm example of rajas. It makes you, you have to get out there and move to do physical exercise. That's true. There is a rajasika element in it. But if you inflect that physical exercise with the touch of sattva, that itself can become a spiritual practice. I gave an entire lecture on this in Hollywood a couple months ago called, some of you might have seen it, Spiritualizing Physical Fitness. I believe strongly in and I try to follow it to the best of my ability. What have studies found? A number of scientific studies have, done, have found that just doing regular physical exercise is more effective as an antidepressant in alleviating mental illness, mental health issues, than prescription antidepressants and prescription medicines. And I'm not saying, and please don't put words in my mouth, I'm not saying don't take prescription antidepressants and other things, no. But alongside those, if you really need them, supplement them with physical exercise. And in some cases, you don't need prescription medication at all. That's up to the psychiatrist or the therapist or the psychologist that's working with you. They'll decide. But often as a first line treatment, physical exercise is better than prescription medications. That's, that's what, that's what stu studies find. And I find that it's true. We, our ashrama in Hollywood is in the foothills of the Hollywood Hills, and I feel just blessed because there are incredible nature trails going all the way up to the Hollywood sign, up to the Griffith Observatory. So I go on these amazing jogs without any, no smartphone, no earbuds, just me and nature. And one of my favorite jogs is to jog up to the Hollywood sign and back. Another one is jogging up to the Griffith Observatory and back, which is almost a half marathon. And what do I do? I repeat the mantra, mantra japa. And you can synchronize the mantra with your breath, with your pace, and you can tailor it to your whatever form of physical exercise you like. I also like swimming. You, you synchronize the mantra with, with your stroke, with your in-breath and out-breath when you inhale. You can spiritualize physical fitness. So then it becomes a sattvika form of rajas. And that itself can help you in your spiritual life. That's just another example. Another really important thing I'll mention. Bhagavad Gita, going back to this wonderful scripture of ours. Gita talks about this concept of swa dharma your own law of being. And the Gita explains, Shreyan swadharmo vigunaha paradharmat svanushtitat svabhava niyatam karma kurvan napnoti kilvisham 
It's better to do the work that best suits your nature, your particular swadharma, even if that work has certain defects, than to do the work meant for somebody else. By doing the work that accords with your own inherent law of being, your own swadharma, you will make spiritual progress. And you will not regress in spiritual life, you'll actually make progress in spiritual life. Now, this has deep resonances with contemporary psychology. There's a whole field called positive psychology. And one of the most famous is named Martin Seligman. He wrote a book called Authentic Happiness. And he says there, there's such a thing as a life based on instant gratification. He calls that the pleasurable life. And he says, in the end, those people become miserable and unhappy. They don't live fulfilling lives. And he says, by contrast, there's a good and meaningful life. And he says, so the million dollar question is, how do we live a good and meaningful life? He says, Instead of orienting your life around different forms of instant gratification, around pleasure, do the following two things. Number one, identify your signature strengths, he calls them. What are your unique strengths and abilities, your talents? Number two, find a vocation, a calling, a way of life that best helps you to cultivate and utilize those signature strengths. That's the recipe for long-term fulfillment. Notice that that's also delayed gratification. Because you're going to face challenges. It's not a, a, you know, a path of roses. Some of these things are very challenging. But it's a challenge that you're up to. Because they, they, your innate abilities meet those challenges. And in the end, those very things, those activities become like nectar. So that's also very powerful. Identify your signature strengths, your swadharma. That's what the Gita means by swadharma. It's based on guna and karma, your innate qualities, and what you do, how you behave with other people. You can assess yourself, you can have your, ask your loved ones to give you, you can, often we're kind of blind to ourselves, so we need that kind of uh, outsider's perspective. It could be your spouse, it could be a loved one, it could be a therapist, to tell you, you don't even know what your greatest strength is. You have such a great heart. Or, you know, you're just, you're, you're, you're so devoted to service. And then a light goes on, you're like, oh, I didn't even know that. And then you can start orienting your life around that signature strength. All right, so I want to just end with uh, a few practical tips. I've said some of them, but I'm going to just repeat them. So first of all, coming back to social media, use of modern technologies, I'm not saying go, go, go cold turkey. I'm saying try to be more mindful in your daily use of modern technologies, social media. Ask yourself, first of all, sort of like these basic questions. What do I get out of scrolling Instagram or Twitter for five hours a day? Am I, getting what I, and, and am I getting out of it what I thought I would get out of it? Just be honest with yourself. Be mindful as you use it. And automatically you'll find as you exercise mindfulness that your use patterns are going to change in different ways. You might use it less. You might regulate yourself in different ways. You might say, I'm only going to use social media at certain times of day. Uh, parents can ban their children from bringing smartphones to the dining, uh, to the dining table, for instance or tell their kids, uh, your phone is gonna be with me at night so that you don't have access, things like that. Uh, there's a technical term for this. G um, scientists use the term self-binding strategies, which is interesting, and, and Lemke calls this dopamine fasting. We all have to be monks in a certain sense. You all have to kind of engage in austerities in this day and age. We have to voluntarily deprive ourselves of various forms of instant gratification for fixed periods. That's the idea. Um, another thing you could do, again, very practical. If you, if, if you are addicted to social media, obviously one of the main culprits is a smartphone. One thing you can do is say, I'll only use social media when I have a tablet or a laptop with me. Immediately that prevents you from reaching down and using social media on your phone. Of course it's difficult, but it's possible. And then you can just automatically regulate, oh, okay, that means I'll use social media before I go to work in the morning, when I come back from work at night, when I have my computer again, and so on and so forth. I told you I'd, t I'd give you a, a sermon on reading physical books, but now, now here it is. Reading physical books is incredible. And it's, you know, there's something, there, the, one of the problems with reading e-books, and it's fine to read e-books um, if you don't have an alternative, but one of the problems is there's a kind of infinite scroll thing going on. And it's, not, it's less tactile. But there's something about reading the physical book that helps you to concentrate and focus. And I can still remember now memorable passages from books in exactly which page and on, on which part of the page it was on. All those things are lost when you're reading e-books with infinite scrolling. Or, I mean, of course, you can also turn pages. But even there, if you're turning pages, you don't know. It, it, it loses that physical tactile dimension. 
Another thing that, if you force yourself to read physical books for like 30 minutes a day, that might sound like a lot, but the idea is it helps with focus and concentration because one of the, one of the huge liabilities in this current age of instant gratification is we're losing the ability to concentrate, focus on a single thing for more than five minutes at a time because of, again, modern technologies and social media. It tells you now, a newspaper article, how many words it has. Why? Because if it has too many words, it's a turnoff, you know? And it's, oh, so it's not worth my time. People don't like to read anything more than, you know, a Twitter kind of quotation or... That's the problem now. So force yourself to read half an hour a day of something good. It could be spiritual literature, it could be sattvika... Uh, novels or something like that. Another thing, another kind of um, symptom of this age of instant gratification is that we're, we've become more narcissistic than almost any previous generation. It's all about me, me, me. Does anyone know who Time's Person of the Year was in 2006? Anyone? You. That's literally what it was. That was the whole, it was, um, and it was not just a gimmick, it was deep. Because it's all about Web 2.0. Web 2.0 is all about oriented around me. I can talk about myself all day, and it's all about me, me, me. There's a whole book called Generation Me. So how do we become less narcissistic? Serving others. This is something that Vedanta strongly emphasizes. It's what Swami Vivekananda calls practical Vedanta. Serve others. By serving others with a spiritual attitude, it's the best way to get out of your own head, to not take yourself so seriously. This is another problem, is that people take themselves way too seriously, them and their little petty problems. It's a way of getting out of yourself, serving others, becoming more selfless, more orienting your lives around other people rather than yourself. So this is a tremendous spiritual practice. Um, and as I already said, Exercise, but exercise, try to make that exercise spiritual. And try to make your daily activities more and more sattvic. That's one of the most important things. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, brother. It was a wonderful talk. Hmm? From marshmallows, mice, and self gratification and uh, self-restraint. That's what Swami Vivekananda says. Self-restraint is more pain. Um, next uh, Sunday, Swami Sumana Sananda, he's the Assistant Minister of the Vedanta Society of Southern California. He will be giving a talk on Thou Art the Supreme Knowledge. Thou Art the Supreme Knowledge. Mm, next Sunday at 11 a.m. On Wednesdays, we have scripture classes at 7.30. You're all welcome to join us in our chapel or meditation room for Arati at 6.30, followed by a meditation. Mm, that is next Wednesday, every Wednesday. Arati is at 6.30, and the class starts at 7.30 in the library. Mm. Thank you so much for coming. And now Swami Medananda will close with a chant, and we will allow him to reach the door. He will greet you all as you leave. And he will meet you in the library for Q&A. Mm. Thank you. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Rama Krishna Rupanamastu Thank you everyone. Hope to see some of you at least in the library. <laughs>